picture of a young girl who became not recognized. She was born Anita Lynch, right back in 1959, and in her teenage years she wanted to become a beauty queen. Um, she grew up a bit and decided to become a nurse because, like her mum, she wanted to help people. She met and married John Cobby, but they separated when in February of 1986, Anita Cobby was brutally murdered. Some months later, uh, in June of the following year, five men were convicted of her death. Now Gary Lynch, Anita's father, was a Christian and some years after the event he was interviewed by the ABC. And what he said will be up on the screen. What he said was, you go through a path that leads right into the centre of hell, but there's a turning point. You don't know whenever it will happen, but it does happen. I have learned forgiveness. I have learned forgiveness. Forgiveness is something we can learn, something that we need to put some time and effort into learning. And again, we probably have never had anything in our lives as, as dreadful as Gary Lynch had in his. But he learned forgiveness. And so it is something that we perhaps should be working on. So last week we looked at forgiveness a little bit and we looked at how forgiveness the idea that we should forgive others because God has forgiven us. We've seen how that appeared time and time and time and time and time again throughout the New Testament. And if we could go to the next screen, please, Ray, we saw some things about God's forgiveness. Not only should we forgive others, we should forgive others as God has forgiven us. How has God forgiven us, we asked. And we came up with four things. God's forgiveness of us was undeserved, but it was to be received with awe and gratitude. It's possible only because of his grace. It requires repentance, and we'll talk more about that today, and it is limitless. Thank you. So, instead of looking at various points all the way through the New Testament, as we did last week, we're going to hone in on one passage, the passage that... Uh, Laomi read for us today and we'll have another look at it today. This is from Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. And we can read, Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy. Remember that phrase, tender-hearted mercy. We're going to keep coming back to it. Clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Up to this point in Colossians, Paul's been saying, take off various things that are not becoming for a Christian. And now he's saying, Put on, clothe yourself. So we read on. And let your peace, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Can you hear the words of the last hymn we sang coming up here? Thanks for choosing that one. <laughs> okay, well it's based on Colossians. Always. Yeah. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So that's the passage we're going to be looking at in more detail today. So let's come into the, the first of the slides, just the beginning of that passage. Since God chose you to be the holy thing he loves, that's the motive. That's why 
we are to clothe ourselves with the various things that Paul mentions there. That's why we're to forgive one another. Because since God has chosen us to be the holy people he loves. A couple of weeks ago, Lynn talked about us as the church being the called out people. It's the same idea. God chose you. He called you out. He made you his. But he didn't, he didn't do that lightly or easily. And he didn't do it for your comfort. He did it so that you might be the holy people he loves. And we remember last week that God forgives us and we accept that forgiveness because of his grace through faith. And we talked a little bit about grace and, and we, we said we're really right to emphasise grace in, in our church because grace is, is really the bottom line. Without grace we're nothing, are we? Without, without grace, the relationship between us and God doesn't exist. So grace is really important. But sometimes when we say it over and over again, it becomes as if God just woke up one morning and said, oh, I might forgive the world today. Yep, that'd be a good thing today. Nice sunny day, I'll forgive them. And it wasn't like that at all, because grace was very costly. Grace cost the Lord Jesus his life and his death. Grace was very costly. So remembering all that, since God chose us to be his holy people, we can have on the bottom of our screen and read there the beginnings of the definition of what forgiveness is. It is because of grace. Now, the Old Testament has various pictures of what that grace looks like. And I thought we'd have a look at one of them today. Do you know what that is? Yeah, indeed it is, the Ark of the Covenant. And where was it? In the Holy of Holies. And where was the Holy of Holies? Part of the temple precinct, where the ancient people of Israel would worship. The Ark of the Covenant, the Ark just means box, was a, was a gold-covered box. It was about two metres by about one metre by about one metre. Covered in gold. I guess it must have been really heavy. Um, and on top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat, or the seat of atonement. And that made a covering for the Ark. Now inside the Ark, do you remember what was there? The two tables of stone. What was on the two tables of stone? The Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments was the law. And they were there to remind people that they hadn't kept the law because that was the only way that a person could see God if he kept the law perfectly. And since they hadn't kept the law, they were cut off from God and God needed to do something about that. And God explains in the Old Testament that the sin of the people that cuts them off from God could be atoned for by blood. That the debt that people owed God because they had sinned could be covered by the blood. And so on the great day of the of atonement, the high priest would go in and he would sprinkle the blood of the goat on that mercy seat and he would lie in sins. And that was a way of teaching the people that their sin that broke the covenant, that broke the Ten Commandments, was covered by the blood and so that they were able to have a relationship with God. So atonement, one of the meanings of atonement is covering. And we have that same idea in the New Testament where Jesus is said to be our covering. In Romans, Paul points out that by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight because through the law comes the knowledge of sin and 2nd chapter, all have sinned and fall short, you know this verse, don't you? Fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift 
through their redemption and as in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation. And that word propitiation is the same idea as atonement in the Old Testament. Jesus himself is our covering, covers our sin. And I, I suspect that's what Peter was talking about when he says uh, in 1 Peter 4, love covers a multitude of sins. Our sin is covered by the blood of Jesus. So, so grace is indeed wonderful and we are right to sing about grace and to thank God with awe and wonder that he chose to save us by grace. But it costs God a lot. It, grace is, is a costly thing. So it is because of his grace, that's the very beginning of our definition of forgiveness. It is because of his grace that we that we are to act, that we are to clothe ourselves, that we are to clothe ourselves with the things that Paul lives. If we could move on. So, because of grace, since God chose you to be... No, if we could go back. Thanks. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. So it's because of grace that we choose to. Now, choosing is an act of the will. It's something that we deliberately decide to do. It's not a feeling thing. It's not, oh, I feel a bit mushy, I'll forgive. It's a, in my head, I will decide to forgive because I have good reason. I will forgive because God has forgiven me. It's a decision that we make. It's not something we feel about. I can just about guarantee you won't feel like doing it at all. It's something you do because you decide in your mind that you will do. And if you decide in your mind, then the feelings may follow. They may follow as it did for Gary Lynch some time later. But they may follow. So it is because of grace that we choose to clothe ourselves. Now, remember when you were little really and you were being taught to do up your buttons, or you, perhaps you taught a child of yours to do up their buttons. It's not a once only thing, is it? And you're not teaching them to clothe themselves for that one day only on which they will wear a shirt, no. You're teaching to, them to clothe themselves so that day after day after day when they get dressed and put on a clean shirt day after day, then they've learned to clothe themselves. So that the clothing yourselves that Paul is talking about here, clothing yourselves, is something that we do habitually. We do it day after day after day. Now there are two difficult questions that we will have a, a quick look at. Two difficult questions about forgiveness that come up every time or what it came up almost every time I spoke with people about forgiveness. The first one was, what do we do about the person who isn't sorry that they've offended you? Does the person who's offended you have to say, I'm sorry, before you forgive them? That's the question. And the second question is, what about the person who keeps on offending? I know that we've got 490, at least, <laughs> and more. So Jesus dealt with both of those questions in a passage in Luke. If we could have a look at that. If your brother sins, <coughs> rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. <coughs> if we just take that, that verse as it is on the surface, just by itself, it looks as though we don't have to forgive him unless he repents, doesn't it? But that's not the meaning of that verse. The second difficult question is a bit easier to answer because Jesus deals with it here. If he sins against you, 
seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you. We had slightly different of heavenly arithmetic last week when we looked at this passage in Matthew. But here in Luke, it's if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back and says, I repent, forgive him. But there's the idea of repentance coming up again. We know that our, our forgiveness of other people is to be unlimited, but what do we do when they don't repent? Okay, this means that we need to think a bit more deeply about what our definition of forgiveness is. Because there's this, this um, hurdle of repentance. And, and when people offend you, quite honestly, they're usually not going to come back and say, I'm sorry, I repent, please forgive me. I don't. I mean, it'd be a nice world if they did, but this sign of heaven, it doesn't seem to always work that way. So we have to do something with this idea of repentance. May we move on? So I'm going to suggest that there is a kind of forgiveness where we forgive as God forgives us, where we act with an attitude of tender-hearted mercy no matter what. Because God always acts with an attitude of tender-hearted mercy no matter what, does he? God is always offering forgiveness. He is always offering tender-hearted mercy. So whether or not the person says, hey, I'm, I'm sorry that happened, but please forgive me, whether or not there is repentance, we should act towards one another with tender-hearted mercy, no matter what. No options, no excuses, no digging under it, no counting up 490 times. We must act toward one another with tender-hearted mercy, no matter what. But that does not mean that the relationship will be restored. The relationship may not be restored unless there is repentance. And I suspect that's what Jesus was talking about in that passage in Luke 17. Let me tell you about a lady I, I used to catch a train with. I, I commuted for many, many years from Wollongong to Sydney. And for, a, for several months, a lady would get on at the stop after mine and sit with me. Um, Sometimes I used to read my Bible on the train, which I guess was a bit of a giveaway, mm. because as soon as she sat down, she said, my husband beats me, and my church tells me I must forgive him. But God has forgiven me, so I must forgive him and continue to live with him. Is that right? What would you say to her? And here's this poor woman, obviously covered in bruises, being told by her church that forgiveness meant she had to go back and live with him. Um, it's kind of hard to say, well, the church is wrong. But the church was wrong, wasn't it? Yeah, the church was wrong. That kind of... The, the kind of forgiveness that we offer doesn't necessarily mean that we have to re-establish a relationship of trust, and um, unity with that person, but we are always to act toward them with tender-hearted mercy. So I did two things for that lady. I put her in touch with the Salvation Army who helped her get a job in Sydney. And the reason she was catching the train was because she was trying to get a job, so the, the Salvation Army helped her get a job in Sydney. Um, and they put her in a, a, a flat of her own in Sydney where she could access work and where she could live independently um, while people were working to um, reconcile the, the husband and wife. Some, some years later, she got on the train again and the relationship had never been restored. So she had left her husband. So a difficult situation. But I, I, I think we misread the Bible if we say, if we say you must forgive all and sundry, you must forgive everyone, no matter what. Yes, we must always act toward them with the tender-hearted mercy that God has shown us and that he continues to show to people. But the relationship of trust doesn't have to be restored, I, I think, until repentance is expressed. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> 
I breathe a couple of, and, and at the risk of being accused of um, text jumping, I've um, gleaned a couple of verses that support what I'm saying. I know that's backwards, but it's an important one, and people think different, and the books about forgiveness say different things. So here are some verses to justify my position. We always act toward the offender with tender-hearted mercy, and from Romans 12, if possible, don't you love that? If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. As far as possible, there is the idea there that it may not be possible. And then, I'm calling it forgiveness plus, because it's not just the tender-hearted mercy that we are to show to one another, it's the restoration of the relationship, so it's plus, like HCO plus cover. It's um, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. Okay, let's move on. Jesus on the cross is often held up as the, the quintessential example of Christian forgiveness because we know that from the cross, Jesus prayed right at the bottom Father, forgive them, the people who crucified them. <coughs> for they don't know what they're doing. Now I think this is an interesting text because during his life, Jesus had claimed the authority to forgive sins. Remember the guy that they lowered through the ceiling? Uh, you know, the four friends, because there was such a crowd around Jesus and they couldn't get him. And Jesus said, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And other, and other times he, he said, I'll forgive you um, for the lady who in adultery, go in peace, sin no more, I forgive you. So Jesus had the authority to forgive. And here he doesn't forgive, he prays for them. And I think that's different. I think it's different because here Jesus is modeling that tender hearted mercy. He's praying for them. Remember earlier in the, um, the Beatitudes, he said, if somebody offends you, forgive them. Um, if, if you're persecuted, don't retaliate, pray for them. Well, that's what he's doing here when on the cross he prays for those who were crucifying him. I don't think this is an offer of unconditional forgiveness. Let's move on. Forgiveness was a priority for Jesus, so much so that he said, if you're going to worship with your brother and sister, against whom there is an offence, then fix it first. Fix it before you go to church. Forgiveness, sorting out those kind of relationships is important. Even a greater priority than worshipping. So, moving on. Back into Colossians. And we'll read it right up there. Since God chose you to be the holy people, in other words, because of grace, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, with kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. <coughs> On the next screen, we've got the first of three things that we do when we clothe ourselves, when we deliberately choose to forgive. And the first one of those is, we give up our right to be paid up. We don't want the other person to be hurt as much as we've been hurt. Now, I don't know whether you watch any of the crime shows on TV, but one of the things the victim almost always says is, I want justice to be done, I want him to hurt as much as I'm hurting you. That is not a Christian attitude. That is not a Christian attitude. Forgiveness is giving up the right um, to make the other person pay, not wanting the offender to be hurt. Um, that's what I think Paul is getting at when he talks about forbearing one another in love, or as our version says, as our version says going back, Make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. 
not want your family to be hurt. Okay, moving on. We do this because our debt was totally cancelled. Remember the story of the um, unforgiving debtor that we looked at in a bit of detail last week? We need to forgive without wanting payback because our debt has been totally cancelled. And, and Paul spells that out in the earlier chapter of Colossians where he says, You who were dead in your trespasses, God made alive, together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Can we move on, please? We must clothe ourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony, because we're in harmony, because we've chosen to overlook the minor offences that occur day by day. We've chosen to overlook those things. We've decided not to keep a record of wrongs. We're doing what 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that we should do. We are remembering that love keeps no record of wrongs. If we could move on, please. There it is. Remember that lovely chapter on love? It, it's patient, it's kind, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not bad. It does not dishonour, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Now there will be a time when you do need to keep a record of wrongs, when a, a particular case is going um, before the legislative system, going to the courts, then you may need to keep a record. Um, if, if you're in a workplace and there is constant bullying, you may need to keep a record. If, if there is sexual harassment, you may need to keep a record of the instances. This is not a blank, tear everything up. But it's saying, with your Christian brother, with whom you are rubbing shoulders every day, bear with one another in love. Forget. Choose to forget. When God says, I forget, I will remember your sins no more, I forget them, God's not saying he's getting a bit dollary. He's, he's not saying that you know, he really can't remember. He's saying he chooses to forget as far as the east is from the west or as deep as the sea. Lovely pictures of God choosing not to keep a record of wrongs. And moving on, please. And this is how that passage in Colossians finishes up. Let's read it together. Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your heart. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. It's a lovely picture of Christians living together in harmony and love, isn't it? So, if we move on. What they are doing in that last section of Colossians is not grumbling about the consequences, showing that God is both good and sovereign. There will always be consequences of wrongdoing. There will always be hurt and damage. We can choose to accept those things graciously, not to be grumbling about, not bringing them up, because we're choosing not to keep a record of wrongs. We can choose, we can choose not to grumble about the consequences, showing that God is both good and sovereign. And at the top in the black on that screen, I've just summarised what that passage is about. It's talking about the peace that comes from Christ. And how much greater is that than the trifling little offences that occur? How much greater is the peace that comes from Christ? And we're exhorted to always be thankful. You can't be both thankful and grumbling in the same breath. You just can't do that. <coughs> Let your message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. How much greater is the richness of all that Christ offers us? The things that we say in that lovely made a mind of Christ him um, just a moment ago. How much richer is what Christ offers us than those 
So I think we're talking about forgiveness on, on kind of two different levels here. We're talking about the forgiveness that means we always act towards one another with tender-hearted mercy, because that's how God acts towards us. That's, toward, that's how God acts towards people who are not yet Christians. That's how God acts. And we are told to forgive as he does. Then I think there's another layer of forgiveness, and it's repentance. That means that then the relationship is restored. But I think that that's dependent on there being some expression of repentance or, or even remorse um, and some deliberate reconciliation. So we started off by looking at someone who had lost a daughter. I want to read you a letter about a man who has lost, about someone who has lost a son. It's written to the person who was responsible for murdering that son. That person is, we call him X, and he's in prison, um, awaiting a death sentence. And this is a letter written to him. Dear X, you are probably surprised that I, of all people, am writing a letter to you, but I ask you to read it in its entirety and consider its request seriously. As the father of the man whom you took part in murdering, I have something very important to say to you. I forgive you. With all my heart, I forgive you. I realise it may be hard for you to believe, but I really do. At your trial, when you confess to your part in the events that cost my son his life and asked for my, repent for my forgiveness, I immediately granted you that forgiving love from my heart. I can only hope you believe me and will accept my forgiveness. But that is not all I want to say to you. I want to make you an offer. I want you to become my adopted child. You see, my son who died was my only child, and now I want to share my life with you and leave my riches to you. This may not make sense to you or anyone else, but I believe you are worth the offer. I have arranged matters so that if you accept my offer of forgiveness, not only will you be pardoned for your crime, but you will also be set free from your imprisonment and your sentence of death will be dismissed. At that point, you will become my adopted child and heir to all my riches. I realise this is a risky offer for me to make to you. You might be tempted to reject my offer completely, but I make it to you without reservation. Also, I realise it may seem foolish to make such an offer to one who cost my son his life. But I now have a great love and an unchangeable forgiveness in my heart for you. Finally, you may be concerned that once you accept my offer, you may do something to cause you to be denied your rights as an heir to my wealth. Nothing could be further from the truth. If I can forgive you, for your part in my son's death, I can forgive you for anything. I know you will never be perfect, but you do not have to be perfect to receive my offer. Besides, I believe that once you have received my offer and begin to experience the riches that will come to you from me, usually your primary response would be gratitude and loyalty. Some would call me foolish for my offer to you, but I wish for you to call me your father. Sincerely, the Father of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Forgive one another as God has forgiven you. finish with amazing grace because it came 